Okay. Thanks for having me up here. I, I love coming up here. Uh, anytime I get an excuse to come to Newport, I do. Uh, and it's great to see some old friends as well in the audience. Uh, my good friend uh, John Hattendorf I just ran into at the Naval Academy. Uh, and uh, fortunately, I was able to get him between his, his lectures. So, uh, like I said, it's nice to have uh, old friends in the audience as well. Uh, what I want to kind of do is set the text or a tone for you uh, so you understand what's going on here and why. One of the things that I really, really am adamant about when I teach down at the uh, uh, Marine Corps University is this, is that history is great, but if you don't understand why things are happening and why things are taking place, they, you kind of miss the ideas. So you have to answer this, this question, why is there fighting going on in the Chesapeake Bay? So that's the first question you want to keep in the back of your mind as I begin my talk. What are they doing there and why are they there? And the second thing is, why do we have a war at all? You know, why is it that James Madison decides in June of 1812 to take on the most powerful nation in the world? Why does he decide to do that? We had, had zero, we had next to zero Navy. We had a very tiny Army. We had a very tiny Marine Corps. Okay, we had, you know, militia forces that were untried and untested. We, what, would he, what was he thinking, you would ask? You know, and, and you know, it would not have been a good strategic, um, you know, response to, to taking on Britain. But he, he thought that the time was right to do something about Britain for years. Uh, one of the problems that, that the Americans ran into with the Great Britain throughout the Napoleonic era was they were caught between two warring powers. And we're going to show you two big reasons why Madison decides in 1812 to go to war against Great Britain. And remember, for Madison, for the Americans, it is a war of choice. He chooses to go to war. And you, and you say, well, why does he do that? And then the second thing he does, he chooses to attack not the British were at sea particularly, although he gets out there early with some of his frigates and gets some early victories. Uh, but he also uh, goes after Canada. Many of you talk to Canadian scholars to this very day. I, just, I was just at a conference this summer and the Canadians are, are convinced we were out to grab Canada for ourselves. And I'm not so sure that was the case. If you're going to go after Great Britain and you have no navy, what are your, what are your other options? You got one other place to go. It's Canada. You can walk across the border to bother them. I think what Madison was thinking about doing was, in exchange for concessions, while Britain was tied down fighting with Napoleon in Europe, remember in June of 1812, Napoleon has just launched his 600,000 man grand army into Russia. Up to this point, Napoleon had run the table. He won everything. He had not been defeated. And when 600,000 personnel go rolling into to Canada, I mean, and into uh, Russia, Napoleon's, uh, and Napoleon's leading them, Madison says, well, he's going to be busy over there, and the British are going to be worried about him. They're not going to be worried about us bothering them in Canada. So that's the problem that uh, the British have, is that this really is a secondary theater of war for them. And that's the big deal. So Madison says the time is right. And the other issue they want to resolve is this. And you'll see this on placards, on, on posters, free trade and sailors' rights. In fact, when I'm corresponding with my British counterparts and my Canadian counterparts, I always put that at the end of my emails. <laughs> they, <laughs> they don't get it. They go, what is free trade? I say, that is why we went to war. And, and then I explain it to them, and they don't want to hear it after that. <laughs> so uh, the prelude to war. Two big operations are going to take place that are going to really set the stage for why Madison chooses to go to war. And they don't have anything to do with us. One is Trafalgar, and the other one is Austerlitz. Okay, at Trafalgar in 1805, Great Britain defeats the combined fleets of Spain and France in a massive sea battle where they lose 17 ships of the line uh, in one fight. That's an incredible, incredible feat. Up to this point, if you lost a couple of ships in any sea battle, that was probably pretty, pretty noteworthy. But Nelson, being the, being the naval hero of his day, the, the, probably the most innovative thinker that the British had at the time at sea, he takes apart this fleet. Uh, and decimates it. 17 uh, other ships in line are defeated. Nelson, unfortunately, is killed at the height of the battle by a sniper. Uh, but nonetheless, he comes back the greatest naval hero probably ever in British history. Uh, the other battle that's going to be fought is Austerlitz, and that's going to be a Napoleonic victory. Napoleon is going to defeat the Third Coalition at Austerlitz, and he's going to complete his iron grip over the rest of Europe. The problem for neutrals like America is that we're caught between the proverbial rock and a hard place. The British are going to begin ramping up uh, and tightening down on, on uh, neutral trade during this time frame, which means impressing sailors, which means seizing cargo, uh, which means making us conform to something called the Rule of 1756, which said that only uh, people we're allowed to trade with in, in wartime are those we were allowed to uh, trade, not allowed to trade with in peacetime, which meant that we could only trade with British colonies. Okay, and only if they allowed it. 
Okay, so the rule of, of 1756, we figured a way around that, they called it broken voyages, where we would sail our vessels to a neutral port, we would take say a cargo, a, a load of cocoa from say uh, Havana, which Spain was an ally of France at the time, and uh, we'd sail it to Marblehead, Massachusetts, we'd offload uh, the, the, uh, the cocoa in Marblehead, then we would re, uh, uh, you know, write a ticket out for uh, the new cocoa, make it in American goods, and then ship it to Europe. Okay, and then we say, but it's a neutral flag, you can't bother us. So the British said, eh, it's kind of a subterfuge around our ability to clamp down on, on trade. So they started taking these ships and seizing them uh, and, and condemning them in admiralty courts. Again, free trade and sailors' rights and pressmen issues. We have the Chesapeake, Leander, and Driver Affairs, where three ships are going to be hauled uh, uh, you know, over at, during uh, uh, various points in the years leading up to the war, particularly the Chesapeake. Nearly go to war in 1807 over uh, the uh, HMS, uh, I think it was Leopard, attacking the, the uh, Chesapeake just off of Hampton Roads. Uh, pretty big deal, uh, and it resounds throughout the United States Navy uh, upper echelons for years. Uh, and then the other one uh, is, is my favorite quote by, by John Roanoke, uh, I mean John Randolph of Roanoke, where he says, uh, the sole reason why we're fighting this war can be summed up in three words, like the eternal cry of a whippoorwill, Canada. Canada, Canada. Now, he's the only one that's saying this. Okay, most of the guys in Congress are saying Canada is the only way we can leverage these British guys and get their attention because they're not going to listen to us any other way. Okay, Trafalgar, there's a, this poster was posted out throughout London uh, right after the great victory. I have it in my office, in fact. I have a copy of it from the Royal Navy Museum. Uh, and the most decisive victory ever, Viscount Nelson wins it. And it's a big deal. Uh, it gives them predominance at sea. Again, free trade and sailors' rights. This is a press gang taking out uh, some poor soul. Uh, but, you know, this is an interesting piece. A lot of people envision press gangs like this. You know, guys going ashore and getting some poor landsman that doesn't know how to, you know, the, the, the front end of the ship from the back, you know, the pointy end from the blunt end. <laughs> you know, but, so, but they would put them in there just as for manpower. But in reality, press sailors came from merchant ships at sea. They were usually not taken from towns for the most, they would take them from towns, but they would normally get ships coming back from a commercial voyage, hang it, heading into the home country. And the problem we had at the time with, with sailors and nationality and national rights were the issue of the British, the British would argue that once a British citizen, always a British citizen. So if, they didn't believe in naturalization at the time. So if you had been a British sailor and you decided to emigrate to America and become an American citizen, if you were caught on board one of these ships, you would be pressed back into service because you, have, you could never renounce your rights to your sovereign in their minds. So the issues of nationality were, were another reason why we had difficulty with the British at this time. So Madison declares war on Great Britain. He asked the Congress, and this is an important line, right from his, right, right out of his uh, Declaration of War. The United States shall, sh he asked whether the United States shall continue passive under these progressive usurpations, meaning free trade and sailor rights violations, or by opposing force to force in defense of our national rights, shall commit a just cause into the hands of the almighty disposer of events. Again, why declare war in June of 1812? Napoleon is marching into Russia. What is the British point of view? The British point of view about this declaration of war is this. This is a stab in the back. They see it as a supreme act of treachery on the part of an ungrateful uh, nation that had been established by Great Britain in the first place, uh, and they're using the, the, their difficulties they're having with Napoleon at the time in order to gain some uh, advantage. Uh, and, and that's what the British do. They also view the Americans as in league with Napoleon. Now, in all my research, I have never once found Madison corresponding with Napoleon, not a single letter, ever. Now, whether they burned him, I don't know, uh, but, but the bottom line was, I don't see anybody, even on Napoleon's uh, lower echelon, I mean, on uh, Madison's lower echelon, like people like Monroe and others, corresponding very, very closely with the French. Napoleon was his own emperor, he was his own thing, and the Americans didn't coordinate whatsoever. They weren't going to take advantage of it, but they really weren't working with them. Right around this time of, of the Declaration of War, here's a, here's a sign of trouble in the Chesapeake. The British are going to pick up on it. There's a major riot taking place in Baltimore. Oh, well, there's not a shock there. Happens a lot. Okay, happens as recently as a year ago, in fact. Okay, Baltimore has a reputation of being something known as a mob town, so to speak. Mobbing meaning they, they're constantly having internal upheaval. And in 1812, it's a Republican pro-Madison town. There was a publisher named Alexander Conti Hansen who was going to publish a newspaper called the Federal Gazette, 
what, that claimed that Madison was a dupe of Napoleon. And he's going to reemphasize this over and over again. So much so that an angry mob smashes his newspaper to, pay, to pieces, and then about a, three weeks later when he returns to the city to try to publish it in a different form from Georgetown, uh, Maryland, uh, he brings in some uh, uh, leaders from the American Revolution, Light Horse Harry Lee from the American Revolution, as well as a guy named James Lingon, who are going to add gravitas to his uh, efforts to get his newspaper published. The mob doesn't care, and they nearly kill Lee, and they do, in fact, kill Lingon in the ensuing riots. But these riots are noted by the British. They realize that Maryland might not be necessarily pro-Madison. And in fact, if you look at the electoral college votes for the uh, 1808 election of James Madison, it, Madison takes the state by a single electoral vote. It's six to five, 11 electoral votes, six pro-Madison votes, five are for Governor, um, uh, War, uh, Gu no, Governor, the guy's name is DeWitt Clinton, that's who it was. Uh, and he was the other guy that was running at the time. He was a Federalist. Uh, so they, uh, they basically uh, you know, had a problem with uh, having a split uh, state right, right off the bat. Okay, here's the British view of Madison. This is one of my favorite cartoons. Right here, you see Great Britain thrusting out a shield. Uh, and who are they handing the shield to? A Native American. Okay, we will protect you against these nasty Americans. Here's an American right in front of the Liberty flag with a Liberty cap on top. Oh, by the way, it's uh, evocative of the French, you know, uh, Liberty caps of, from the French Revolution. Uh, here's Napoleon to the left of Madison, uh, and, he's, and he's saying, uh, I suffer greater hardships than you, but don't worry, the devil will help us both. And on the right, uh, the devil is dancing around here saying, I better take these two down to hell so I can fix them up because they're getting too nervous here. Uh, but I love this guy up here. This is the angel Gabriel, and he's blowing a trumpet. And you can't read it, but right here it says, bad news for you. <laughs> so Britain is now aroused, holding the lion back, getting ready to attack. And look what they're suggesting. We're going to arm and... And, and arm up the Native American tribes on the frontier. So you, you want to play this game, two can play at it. And that's exactly what they do. And again, problems in Baltimore, Montgomery County war dance. This is one of my favorite cartoons as well. This is uh, Robert Gudlow Harper. He was actually uh, one of the two lawyers that defended Aaron Burr in his famous treason trial. They get him off the hook. He beats the rap, so to speak. Uh, and uh, he is hated by the Republicans in Baltimore. Uh, these guys dancing around, uh, are some of them are unknown, but some of them are Light Horse Harry Lee. Some of them are James Lingon. Some of them are about 20 or 30, but are all from Montgomery County, Maryland. They're not from Baltimore. They are pro-Federalists. And so what they're saying is these guys are coming to Baltimore to stir up trouble. And one of the guys had a letter and he says, well, if we, don't, we can't find enough arms to protect ourselves, let's just arm ourselves with hatchets. So they made sure they put these little <coughs> hatchets in their hand right there. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? Girl, early naval success in the War of 1812 is also going to set the stage. This is a big deal because up to this point, when the USS Constitution takes on the USS Guerriere in the summer of 1812, in recent memory, in fact, the British could not remember a single time in 30 or 40 years, perhaps, even longer, where an, Amer where a, an enemy ship had taken one of their ships of like size and armament in a ship-to-ship -ship engagement. This was absolutely unheard of. This was a shock to the British pride and also to the Royal Navy. Uh, and this is followed up very quickly with taking of the USS Java, I mean, taking of the HMS Java, and later on the United States is going to take, take a, a, a ship, the Macedonian, uh, under Stephen Decatur. So the, this is a big deal. Uh, and so the British are going to lose a couple of ships in secession. Why is it that we have success? And I argue that our frigates were not really frigates. Okay, they were called super frigates in some people's minds. 44 guns, they actually manned, had mounted 54 guns. The British frigate was typically between 38 and 40 guns. So they were going up against a larger ship that was more of a hybrid. It was a hybrid ship between, say, a, a, it would be a very, very light ship of the line. We didn't have a single ship of the line. It's a ship, the lowest level ship of the line that the British had was a 74 gun ship. That was their main battleship, so to speak. After that, you had frigates, and brigs, and sloops, and that sort of thing. In this case, we have these big, big frigates. So whenever our frigates went up against their frigates, usually their frigates got the worst of it. And so, but they would say it was a frigate-to-frigate -frigate fight, but was it really? Andrew Lambert would say it was not. <laughs> That's right. So. 1813 British strategy is to break into the Chesapeake Bay. What the British are trying to do, remember that's the other question I said, why the Chesapeake? 
The British are moving to the Chesapeake in 1813 because of the 1812 fighting in the Canadian frontier. The Americans go into Canada with a three-pronged attack. None of them do very well, but it scares the hell out of the British because they don't have very many soldiers in North America. They're all tied down dealing with Napoleon at the time. So as a result, they're in Spain and they're obviously worried about what Napoleon's <laughs> going to do in Russia and what happens if he's successful there. So what they do is they said, well, let's change the venue. Let's move the fleet into the Chesapeake Bay. They don't have a navy. They can't protect it. We can go where we want with our fleet. We don't really have to invest a lot. We can use Royal Marines for the most part. We can use Royal Navy ships and we can get into this bay. And the idea is they're going to conduct raids along the length and breadth of the bay and they're going to kill off the American privateers that have heretofore have been using this bay for a very lucrative uh, safe harbor, so to speak. And this is an important part. And this is said by Captain Thomas Lawrence who says, we want to cause the Americans to feel the hard hand of war. In other words, you're going to regret what you did just the previous year. And oh, by the way, this is what happens when you attack a superpower. And this is what happens when you really don't have any ability to defend yourselves. We're going to make you feel it. And we're going to make you sue for peace. So what they want to do is they want to come in. They don't want to hold Maryland. They don't want to hold Virginia. But they want to make it hard. They want to, they want to make it painful. So they're going to burn, pillage, and, and damage as much as possible. Okay? And if possible, if, if these things fall in their hands to sack the larger bay towns of Norfolk, Annapolis, and even the larger city of Baltimore, if the opportunity presents itself. And look at this last one. Capture or sink the USS Constellation. Constellation at this time had gotten uh, blockaded in the port of Norfolk. It wasn't going anywhere, but it, you know, it's one of those famous things the Navy uh, likes to write about. It's kind of its own fleet and being. As long as the Constellation exists, the British must have at least four or five large ships watching the port who are not available to do raids, who are not available to do fleet operations. So the const constellation, even though it's not fighting, represents a fleet in being of one. Okay, works out okay if you're the Americans, so it, it actually is a pretty good trade. Okay, so they're going to sack these towns so they can get in, but they also want the constellation if possible. They can also deal with these two guys right here. Now this is the, uh, the Pride of Baltimore, otherwise known as the USS Chasseur. It was a privateer that was captained by a guy named Thomas Boyle, the most famous privateer of, of all the Chesapeake Bay privateers. This would be the equivalent of a Maserati sports car. Fast, sleek, rakes, rakes uh, very steep rake to the, to the mast itself. Uh, there's a replica of it in Baltimore Harbor today. This one over here is also in existence. This is the Lynx. This is more of a letter of mark ship. It's just a little bit smaller version than, than the Pride of Baltimore. They're down there for Fleet Week in Norfolk. Uh, they both exist. The Lynx is actually on the west coast near Monterey, uh, and this is obviously in Baltimore Harbor. But these ships were, were privateers that were doing some damage to the British maritime community. Uh, and so they said, we bring a fleet into the bay. These guys can't get out anymore, and that's exactly what they do. Uh, and, and this guy is going to lead the fleet. His name is Sir John Berlays Warren. He's 59 years old, and he has some diplomatic experience. He was a former uh, a minister to Russia uh, prior to the war, and he's told by the Admiralty to bring a swift end to the American flare-up. In other words, just end it with what you got, your, your naval ships. He immediately tells the Admiralty, I don't have enough, and the Admiralty says, well, during the American Revolution, uh, we had uh, you know, half as many ships that we've given you, and we seem to do fine, at least till the very end. <laughs> and so he says, uh, that's, that's a very different time. Uh, I'm asked to defend Canada. I'm asked to defend the West Indies. I'm asked to conduct an offensive war in America with less than 100 ships. Uh, he doesn't get any more ships. The British say, make do with what you got. Okay, this is his second in command. And this guy, this guy, is and he actually pronounces his name Coburn. The British pronounce it Coburn. I was told that when I was at a conference in London. I mispronounced his name. and he, Andrew Lambert made sure I cor he corrected me on the spot, in fact, I think. Uh, but George Coburn uh, is a master and commander. This guy recognizes the maneuverability that having the fleet under his command with unlimited access to any place up and down the Chesapeake Bay. He appears simultaneously in major roadsteads over and over and over again. And he does so for a specific reason. Because every time he shows up in the mouth of the Potomac River, every time he shows up at the mouth of the Patapsco River or on the eastern shore, it serves to freeze the Maryland militia in place. So when it looks like he's threatening Baltimore in 1813, which he's going to do, he's actually going to put channel markers out there. And look, he's going to come ashore. He's going to look like he's lightening his, uh, his ships in order to make a landing. The, American, the Maryland militia say, we've got to defend Baltimore. And then a day later, he's on the eastern shore. So all the militia doesn't move out of Baltimore because they say he might come back. 
Meanwhile, he rips up the eastern shore. And so every time he lands Royal Marines, the Maryland militia is at a disadvantage. Freezes them in place. Maneuver freezes the land forces in place. It is operational maneuver from the sea, folks. Early version. Okay, so that's why I like, well, I don't like him, but uh, I admire his tactics. <laughs> and you can see, uh, he's, he's, this is a picture of him. He has his, it was his portrait he had commissioned. He's standing in front of the burning buildings of Washington right there. Very proud of his handiwork, so to speak. Okay, so the Upper Bay Raids is going to attack on the eastern shore of Frenchtown. He reveals his modus operandi for the campaign. He says if anybody dares to resist when we go ashore to get resupply, that we will then torch the town. So if the militia show up and fire even a single shot, if they fire any, find any military supplies, he sets the whole town on fire. And so he does this repeatedly. Remember, his modus operandi is also to cause pain, to cause the Maryland politicians to begin to Hector Madison. You got to pull those regiments off the Canadian frontier to protect us. You got to sue for peace. This is getting too hard. We don't like this. And they're losing a lot of, lot of value. They're running off uh, slaves because Maryland is a slave state. They're running off uh, livestock. And they're basically taking to war to the, to the Americans, showing them the hard hand of war, just like they said they would. They try a foray against Elkton. They don't do so well. But they do very well at a place called Have the Grace. They also burn Georgetown and Fredericktown on the eastern shore. They're all sacked and heavily damaged uh, during this fight. This is Have the Grace going up. Uh, I was able to identify the identity of this guy here. He's got his arm in a sling. His name is George Westfall. He is uh, Coburn's favorite naval commando. He sends them on all these raids in, in, up shore. They go to the Sassafras River. They go to the Bohemian River. They go to the Miles River. They, they, go all, they, they go to all these rivers, and they go as far inland as it can go. The Americans did not believe they had this kind of maneuverability. But it's maneuver that, that really does them well. And, and Coburn recognizes it and uses Westfall, Westfall as his lieutenant. And this, these guys do a really good operation, operational maneuver from the sea against the Americans. They set uh, Habit Grace on fire. They burned most of the town. About 60 uh, wooden uh, houses were set on fire by Congreve rockets. At the Battle of Have the Grace was much of a battle. The Americans do have a, a land battery there. They called it the Potato Battery. I don't know why they called it that. But it was manned by a lieutenant named John O'Neill. Uh, he's later captured. Uh, but they, they set the entire town on fire by just firing these Congreve rockets and, and then burning it down. Okay, the next target is the one they really wanted to get, and that's Norfolk. Why Norfolk? The Constellation is there, but it's also a pretty big seaport at the time. So they're going to get a, a, a resupply of soldiers. Now, note who they get. They get the 102nd Regiment of Foot. You go, that's good, right? Who is the 102nd Regiment of Foot? A little research on my part, I discovered they were actually the former New South Wales Corps. New South Wales, does that ring a bell? Where's it located? Australia. Australia. What did the British use Australia for? What do you suppose the regiment that guarded their prison colony was like? They were prisoners themselves. Anybody that you didn't like in your regiment, you sent to the New South Wales Corps to get them out of your unit. These guys were the worst of the worst. They were so bad that eventually the governor of New South Wales, a guy named William Bly, a former captain of the HMS Bounty who had been mutinied upon by his own crew uh, is held under house arrest by this regiment because he deemed interfere with their rum concession they ran in, in Australia. <laughs> Nonetheless, they come to the United States as this 102nd Regiment of Foot. They've been kind of renamed, but it's still the New South Wales Corps in reality because the same guys are there. They merely have a mini mutiny on the island of Bermuda before they go to America. They have it, they have to, a number of them are executed for, for inciting a riot. Uh, but Warren says, I'm going to use this because that's the best I can get. You're, where are the best troops at? They're under Wellington in the Peninsula Campaign in Spain. They are in, they're in England getting ready for what might happen in Russia. So as a result, Warren is going to get what he has to get. So Warren wants to take the Constellation. He's also got to worry about the forts at Nelson and Norfolk. And he's got to get past the militia of Craney Island. The defense hinges on Craney Island. If you go down to Norfolk today, Craney Island is still there. It's connected to the mainland today. And, and it's still uh, you know, part of that kind of naval establishment down there. Uh, their blockaded marine detachment and sailors from the Constellation are going to be utilized, though, in this coming fight at Craney Island. And it's going to be a major check. They send the colonel uh, of the 102nd uh, Regiment of Foot, fails to re recon the island defenses, and as a result, they are going to go into Norfolk kind of very arrogantly, uh, thinking they're going to run off the militia like they had done every time before. Except this time, the militia is leavened in with the sailors off the, the Constellation, who, by the way, know how to fire naval ordnance, and the Marines as well, who are fairly well disciplined from the Marine Detachment, and gonna, they also know how to fire lighter guns. And the Virginia militia actually performs very well. 
they do quite well against this particular fight. Lieutenant Henry Breckinridge, for instance, in, in Marine Corps, is going to be in command of the Marines. The later, the British are going to claim that the Americans committed atrocities on the wounded that got caught in the mud flats as they try to get ashore in Craney Island. One of the things is you, you, you have to have a beach uh, sort of recon. They don't even do that. So as they're rowing their boats towards the, uh, the seaborne attack on Craney Island, they run a, aground on unseen mud flats. Well, you've been to Hampton Roads. You can walk out in the middle of Hampton Road for a mile before it gets over your knees. Uh, well, they didn't, they didn't know that. So they put these, uh, these uh, soldiers and Marines in, in boats, tried to row them over those mud flats. They got caught about 300 meters out from the shoreline. Stationary targets for who? USS Constellation Cannoneers who just decimate them with round shot, grape shot, and anything else they could fire at them. This is the commanding officer of uh, the, uh, the militia. He's a lawyer by trade, so he has his portrait painted not as a militia commander, but as a lawyer. <laughs> He's reading from his law book, uh, Robert Berard Taylor. But he actually does a pretty good job of defending Craney Island. And here's the Battle of Craney Island right here. British had to try to get ashore here, and they get run off here, they get run off here, and it's a major victory for the Americans. The British are not, now going to take their, their, you know, their ire out against the town of Hampton across the, uh, uh, the bay. They're going to pretty much brutalize the population. But the 1813 response to be summed up is this, amazingly tepid response from the Madison administration. Despite the devastation, he does not do anything about sending regular regiments to the region. He keeps them up there on the Canadian frontier. Although Norfolk's preserved, the smaller bay towns pay a price. There was a plea of the St. Mary's County, Maryland citizens saying, you need to send regiments down here. The British are landing and robbing us blind. And Secretary of the War John Armstrong said, I can certainly, I cannot be expected to defend every man's cabbage patch. <laughs> so he says, I'm not going to do it. Uh, Commodore Joshua Barney then enters the picture. Joshua Barney is kind of a semi-retired uh, admiral. He also was a very, very smart guy. He's a very, very tough guy. He does have a period of time where he sells his services to the French, so therefore he's kind of under suspicion uh, because we do fight this quasi-war with France in 1798 uh, to uh, 1800, and Barney was technically still in French service, although he doesn't fight against the Americans. But people said, oh, you know, not really sure of his loyalty. But Barney is living in Maryland, and he says, well, we don't have a navy, but what we can do is we can build galleys and we can man those galleys up with a special flotilla force and why would you want to have a galley to go up against these sloops and these frigates that are going to be up and down the bay? Because you don't need wind power. They're oar power and they're highly maneuverable. He sees the galleys like swarms of angry bees buzzing around these larger British ships that would be largely immobile if the wind isn't in their favor. And that's exactly what he hopes to do. Here he is right here. He's the last best hope of the Chesapeake Bay. So in 1814 he is enemy number one for the British. All they think about is taking out Barney and the flotilla. That is the number one military target in 1814 when the British returned to the bay uh, the next summer. Problems with the galleys. Who wants to be in a galley? My God, that's not, that's not real Navy. Okay, what is that? These bunch of guys that got to roll around and you don't get prize money hardly. And by the way, they're very vulnerable. Okay, low bulwarks, lack of protection for crew. They were very leaky. Not part of the regular Navy establishment. You know, the Secretary of Navy says, I don't want all these galleys under my command. I, don't, I can't feed them. I can't pay them. So they have contractor problems right off the bat. The first galleys they build doesn't work very well. Their rudders are broken. They're built in St. Michael's and, and in Baltimore itself. And it's important to note, U.S. Marines do not serve aboard them. Captain John Mil uh, Samuel Miller of the USS Marine or the U.S. Marine Detachment at Marine Barracks 8th and I, Washington, D.C., is going to operate on land, but not in the flotilla itself. This is Barney's own drawing. It's in the Library of Congress. He drew these little sketches. He says, here's what a galley should look like. But he had problems because the contractors were trying to cut costs and cut corners. They'd never do that, do they? Okay? Contractors would never do that. Okay? And in fact, uh, he says, please send me the Black Snake, which was the it was a template built galley that was sitting in the Washington Navy Yard. He says it to uh, Secretary of Navy Jones. Send me the black snake, he says, so I can use it as a template to make these thick skulls here do their duty, meaning the contractors. They never do get it right. The poor galleys just were awful, uh, but they were okay. I mean, they, they, he, he could get them down the bay if he needed to. They were just tough and it would leak a lot. And nobody liked to be on them. Here's one of the, here's one of the flotilla men. This is a free African American named Charles Ball. And this is what they look like. Uh, it says flotilla up here on his hat and a little ribbon band up there. Here's the other uh, uh, poor man's navy they tried to do, and it was torpedoes. Now, not torpedoes that you see in the museum today. They had these stationary things. They would actually, uh, sometimes they would float these torpedoes. They were like floating bombs. Uh, and a guy named Elijah Mix 
is going to experiment with these torpedoes. They're actually going to uh, think uh, Stephen Decatur is going to try to put one here in Newport Harbor. There's going to be one in uh, New York, and there's going to be a number of them in, in Baltimore itself. But they, none of the cities would really want them around because it was just emerging technology. Uh, the British call it the Yankee torpedo. Uh, and here, uh, here's uh, a British tar right here. He's turning his backside to this torpedo that's blowing up. This is a, a, an alleged incident that took place off of Cape Henry Light. Uh, the HMS Plantagenet 74 gun was on stationary blockade duty. Elijah Mix takes a small vessel that he creates out of his own pocket called Chesapeake's Revenge. And he puts this torpedo there uh, and he's going to dump it over the side and it's on a wire and as it floats with the current it's going to bump up against the hull of this uh, 74 gun ship and he's going to set it off and blow it up. His first two attempts a guard boat stops and so he had to run away. The third attempt it almost works. He gets about maybe within 10 yards of the ship and it blows up prematurely. Uh, it, tons of seawater go cascading over the Plantagenet's deck, but it doesn't do a darn thing to the hull. And so the British don't think much of mines or torpedoes. They're going to think about it later on uh, in, in the 19th century. But here it says, blow up my hull indeed. You can kiss my taffril, Mr. Yankee Doodle. <laughs> and so he's basically, uh, they're saying, we don't care what you try against us. You're, you're just, you know, these are just forlorn hopes. Uh, the Marine Barracks at 8th and I is where the Marines are going to be located uh, during this 1814 campaign. They're going to be utilized in two battles. One, the Battle of St. Leonard's Creek, and the other one at uh, the Battle of Bladensburg. They're going to do pretty well at Bladensburg. They're going to do not so well at St. Leonard's Creek, although not because they didn't try. It's just the way things turned out, and I'll explain to that in, in a second. These are his 12-pounders that he, would, he utilized during the war. They would... Uh, typically have about 103 infantrymen, uh, some that would, that would man these guns, the rest would be providing infantry support, and they would be light artillery, mobile. They, were, they could move them around, so they were very, very easy to get from one point of the battlefield to the other. And the Marines were experimenting with this light artillery because that's what the Royal Marines were doing. The Royal Marines were doing Royal Marine light artillery tactics at the time, so the U.S. Marines were doing the very same thing. They're kind of imitating the Royal Marines as their model. Okay, Warren's replaced by this time, and they're going to bring in a new guy named Alexander Cochran. I'm going to show you a picture of him in a minute. But Cochrane's going to really, really want to utilize all the forces at his disposal and severely punish the Yankees. His operational strategy is much the same as the year before. He says he's going to cause mischief and damage, and he wants the Americans to pay. And he's also going to go directly after what he believes is their main source of economic welfare in the region. He says that the Americans are vulnerable because they've enslaved a lot of people who don't want to be enslaved, which is very true. And he's going to run off about 3,000 to 4,000 slaves and give them the option of resettling somewhere else in the British Empire or becoming what he calls colonial marines. And I'll tell you what, what I'll show you a picture of that in a, in a second. This is uh, Alexander Cochran. He's one of uh, Nelson's guys at one, uh, one time. He also has extensive North American experience. He's a very smart guy. He says if you want to defeat the Americans, you take them on in two places. You take them on the Chesapeake and you take them on at New Orleans. He tries to do both. Uh, and he's unsuccessful at both thanks to uh, circumstances, particularly in, but the Chesapeake region looked like it was initially going to be successful. Okay, his strategy, liberate slaves, colonial marines. Again, strategic objective, possible assault, he mentions Rhode Island. There's, I have a letter, it was a secret letter he wrote to the Admiralty where he says, uh, you know, you're giving me these reinforcements this summer, um, do you, where do you want me to use them? He says, I recommend we go up to Rhode Island and just ransack Narragansett Bay. Okay, and then, Coburn, his second in command, says, nah, these Americans down here in the Chesapeake, they're too easy. He says, we can do whatever we want if we get enough people. He says, we can take Baltimore, we can take Annapolis, we can take Washington, we can really embarrass the administration. He says, much easier than, than going up to Rhode Island. And he says, besides, we don't want to mess with the uh, New Englanders. They're kind of, you know, not really thrilled with the war anyway. So as a result, uh, they stick with Washington and the Chesapeake area as their main objective. Uh, so that's exactly what they do. These are the Colonial Marines. They wore a red coat, and they were great for guides. Uh, they would, and one reason why the British were so good at raiding far up rivers is because they used these guys as guides. They could say, okay, this is the plantation of where I used to live, and they have stuff here, and they have stuff here, and they have stuff here. I know exactly where it is. They were great for raids, uh, and, and it really hurt the American cause because the British are going to turn their, their assets against them. Okay, and the Colonial Marines... Uh, Every single raid that, that uh, Cochrane's going to um, operate on in 1814, they're going to be at least a company of these guys in each one of these raids. This is what a Southern Maryland raid looks like. Again, they find anything, they set it on fire, uh, they take all the things that can be carried off, uh, and uh, then they move on to the next plantation. So it, it's designed to be a punitive 
expedition every single time. Now, remember I told you there's two fights that are going to be involving U.S. Marines. One is the Battle of St. Leonard's Creek. Barney's flotilla gets run up the Patuxent River because he runs into a 74-gun ship of line, HMS Dragon. Uh, and the winds fail at the exact moment that Barney needed the winds to be in his favor, so therefore he must row up this river and he gets stuck up this little creek. He's literally a like a, he's, a, he's a stuck up a creek without a paddle. He's, he, uh, they put a couple of British ships at the uh, mouth of St. Leonard's Creek and the Patuxent River, and Barney's going nowhere. In fact, the Secretary of Navy is so upset with Barney, he says, just burn the flotilla. It's a nice experiment. Didn't work out. And come back to Washington, D.C. And Barney says, no, 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 no. Let me try, let me try something. So he gets uh, the, the uh, Army to support him and building a, a, a land battery right here. Uh, and they're going to put it on a bluff overlooking St. Leonard's Creek. And the idea is they're going to open up on these British blockade ships and drive them off from the mouth of the creek in order for Barney's flotilla to come, out, come down the creek, blast their way through the blockade, and then get further up the Patuxent River. And that's exactly the way it works out. The problem was they didn't coordinate the activities between the Army and the Navy. Joint operations didn't work well in 1814. We're a little better today, but I don't know how much better. <laughs> okay? So the Army... Uh, is supposed to coordinate with the Navy. They want both attacks to happen at the same time. So at 3 a.m. in the morning, uh, Colonel Decius Wadworth says to uh, Barney, I'm not ready to start firing yet. I've got to move the cannons around. I'll let you know. And at 4 a.m., Barney is shocked to hear Wadsworth's cannon begin to open fire. He's 45 minutes away from the fight. He now has to row all the way down the creek, and he does so. He has a Marine battery over here under Samuel Miller firing round shot. They only got 12-pounders, so they're going to run out of round shot pretty fast. And Miller, at the height of the fighting, says, I'm out of ammunition. What do you want me to do? And he tells that to Sailing Master Gohagen down here at the main battery. Gohagen, being the senior, arm, senior Navy man on the ground, says, got it, Captain Miller. He says, pull your guns back so they can support uh, in case there's an infantry attack later on further up the peninsula. Miller then retreats up the peninsula. Two army regiments standing nearby, seeing Miller's cannons being pulled out and going up the peninsula, says, they must know something we don't. And they follow the Marines up the peninsula, retreating without firing a shot. The colonel is absolutely mortified. He blames the entire debacle on the United States Marines. He says, the Marines left the field of battle without being ordered to do so. Gohagen, fortunately, says, no, no, no. Miller asked me to go. I told him he could go, and therefore he was exonerated a little bit later on. But it still left a bad taste in Miller's mouth that he was somehow accused of leaving the field under fire. One of the reasons why you'll see Barney and Miller not giving an inch at Bladensburg. I think that Miller says, accuse me once of doing that. You're not going to do it a second time. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened. Okay. Cochrane's plans for 1814 is a three-pronged attack, just like Coburn did the year before. Appear in multiple places at the same time freezes the militia in place. They can't go anywhere. The Eastern Shore militia can't come over because he's got a squadron going up there under a guy named Sir Peter Parker. He's got another squadron threatening the Potomac River under a guy named Alexander Gordon. Uh, and, then, uh, and then a third guy himself, he's going to threaten the Patuxent Roadstead, and that's, a, that's his real main attack. His main attack is the Patuxent River attack. He goes to Patuxent River, he lands at Benedict, Maryland, he marches overland all the way up to Bladensburg. And he gets to Bladensburg, he's going to fight one big battle, he's going to threaten Washington, D.C. Barney's flotilla is going to have to get destroyed because as he goes up towards uh, Upper Marlboro, Maryland, Barney runs out of river, so he has to burn his ships anyway. Barney then moves his forces to Washington. But here's the problem. He get, as he gets up there, he says he wants to attack Washington, D.C. in order to humiliate the Madison administration. And he does so. Okay, but he, Winder, incredibly, the, the American commander in charge of the operation, makes no attempt to delay Ross on his route of march. So the Secretary of, of War, Armstrong, convinces Madison that a British march westward is just a Cossack hurrah, meaning a raid. They won't stick around here very long. They'll just go back because they're too far away from their ships. They have no cavalry. They have very little artillery. So he says a real invasion would have that. So as a result, he tells Madison not to worry. Winder fights a single battle. He could have fought the British for 20 miles, falling back each way. The British are shocked. The Americans don't even fire a shot. Okay, they literally walk from Benedict, Maryland, all the way to the D.C. line without getting engaged whatsoever. And the British found that absolutely astounding. They said that the Americans have no heart for the fight. Okay, Winder just was the guy that was leading them, and he didn't understand what he could have done. So he's going to basically fight this fight at Bladensburg. It's going to be a massive debacle. They call it the Bladensburg Races. Uh, and, and Robert Ross leading four British regiments are going to crash through the American lines. The 85th Regiment of Foot is going to be the lead echelon regiment up here. 
crosses the bridge. He literally knocks the first two American lines aside without really firing a shot. They fired Congreve rockets into the entire regiments who flee when the first rocket lands. And eventually, he's going to run into more stalwart people on the third line. They're about a mile and a half away. Marines and sailors over here. Army over here under the uh, command of William Winder. The problem is, as these first two lines give way, the British are now flowing towards this line right here. Winder makes the decision to, to retreat. He's an army commander. He doesn't believe the Navy or the Marines are in his chain of command. So as he retreats, he doesn't tell the Navy and the Army he's leaving. Okay? So as a result, the Navy and Army are standing there and they're going, where are those guys going? <laughs> so, too late. The British then begin lapping around on both of the flanks uh, of the Navy and Marines. Winder, uh, I mean, Winder's long gone. Uh, Barney's going to take a shot in the thigh, pretty serious wound. It's eventually going to cause his early death about four or five years later. Uh, Miller's going to get shot in the arm, uh, leading a counterattack, the commanding officer of the Marines. So both the senior leaders of the Marines and Navy are down. Uh, eventually, Barney's going to order the Marines and the Navy to retreat back towards Washington, D.C., which they do in good order. Uh, but uh, the Army had long gone, and so had the militia. So that's the end of Battle of Bladensburg. Then the British move into Washington. Here's the Marines on the firing line at Bladensburg. And then here is the burning of Washington. Now this is a pretty big inferno there. It wasn't as bad as what this picture looks like. But here's an important point to remember. I was at the White House in 1991 on active duty. And they took off 22 layers of paint on this right side of the building, the north portico side, um, the north face of the White House. Uh, and as they did, they revealed the sandstone and the brick uh, underneath the bare brick and the bare sandstone. And I could see the scorch marks around each side of the window. And they still have parts in the White House where, for historical purposes, they've left the scorched brick still in place. Most of it's since been replaced, obviously, but over the years it crumbles and gets bad. But the historic brick that had been burned, you can still see it. They have a big section of it in the White House Historical Association. It's really interesting to see. So prima facie evidence that, yes, the White House got burned. But here's what happened at the, during the burning of Washington, D.C., and what didn't happen. And, and I've heard this many times from my friend Ralph Eshelman. The Americans are going to burn more buildings in Washington than the, than the British do. What are the Americans going to burn? The biggest thing in Washington besides the very small government buildings in the White House that are still left. The Navy Yard. The Navy Yard is going to be the biggest conflagration of buildings and it's going to be set on fire by not the British but by ourselves. We don't want the British to get it. A guy named uh, Thomas Tingey, his uh, house, the Tingey House is uh, one of the two buildings that actually remain standing. Uh, it's going to be there, but as he, uh, Thomas Tingey himself is a former British citizen. He rows a skiff across the uh, Potomac to uh, Alexandria when the British show up. At the very last minute, he sets the, uh, the, the, uh, the Navy Yard on fire. He comes back the next morning, sneaks back into town while the British are still there, only to see the local denizens of the community looting his home, <laughs> taking out everything he owns and stealing it uh, while the uh, chaos was ruling inside Washington, D.C. Uh, the Navy Yard is, is, is trashed. It lost hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of material, but the British didn't get it. Uh, but the British don't burn uh, the Marine barracks. Now, the Marines love to tell you this, and I always have to tell this to a Marine, on, Marine audience. Is it, they used to say, well, they didn't burn the Marine barracks because out of honor of the Marines uh, fighting at Bladensburg, uh, they were spared this, this uh, ignominious uh, you know, torching of their, their barracks. And that's not true. Uh, two British officers rode down the hill from Capitol Hill as Tingey was blowing up the Navy Yard. And they came back and told uh, Coburn, there's nothing left down there to loot. And so uh, they also recognized that the Marine Barracks, which was located in a neighborhood, a residential neighborhood, very close to civilian uh, buildings, working people worked down there. That was the Eastern Market at the time. The Navy Yard was the big, big industry at the time. So it had a lot of working class people's houses down there. And, and uh, C Coburn and Ross were not about burning down neighborhoods. They were about burning down public buildings. So they left it alone. I think it was spared because it was next to a residential area. That's why it was spared. So the Marine Barracks do not get burned. It's still there to this very day. The Commandant's House, built in 1801, is one of the oldest standing houses in Washington, D.C. today for that very reason. Okay, this guy Gordon is going to take on uh, Alexandria. He's going to come up the Potomac River as the British are marching out of the town. He loots Alexandria. They, they very callowly kind of surrender. They don't put up a fight, but they don't have anybody to fight with. Their militia had been on the other side of the river fighting at the Battle of Bladensburg, and they ran off with the rest of the militia and were driven out uh, at the same time. So they have to surrender, and Gordon uh, gets a lot of the material and takes it with him back down the river. So the temerity of, of the British is pretty bold. They can, they can loot a town like Alexandria going way up a river uh, in order to do that. They get back uh, without really getting harassed too much. 
Uh, they, there is a little bit of a firefight by uh, David Porter at a place called White House where modern day uh, Fort Belvoir is, but they get back. Which brings us up to the last campaign. Uh, here's where things start to turn around for the Americans at last. Okay, Bladensburg is a debacle. The British call it the Bladensburg races, and they don't have a very good reputation of, of fighting uh, you know, the British at all. So when they come up to Baltimore three weeks after they fight the Battle of Bladensburg, they think that it's going to be another Bladensburg races. The problem is the Americans here are led by a guy named Samuel Smith. He is a former uh, lieutenant colonel in the American Revolution. He fought at the Battle of Fort Mifflin in Philadelphia, defended it quite well against the British back then. He's now a major general of militia, but here's the most important thing. He's also a sitting U.S. Senator for the state of Maryland. So when Smith asks for something, he gets it. Not like Winder, when he asked for something, they kind of yawned and said, maybe. Okay, but when Smith wants it, he gets it. But he puts forward uh, a, a pretty large reconnaissance and force under his chief lieutenant named John Stricker. He's right here. He's going to move down from Baltimore, down this peninsula called Patapsco Neck. I went to uh, elementary school at Patapsco Neck Elementary. I went to North Point Middle School, and I went to Dundalk Senior High. So all those places that I'm talking about are all down where I used to live. Three regiments are going to be abreast. This side, though, is a little bit uh, not well done by Stricker because Stricker's not there to fight a main engagement. He's there to fight delaying action. The British see his right flank is not well guarded. They send a flanking column around. Uh, he sends his last two regiments up to stop this flanking column, and they get run off very quickly. So it looks like Bladensburg all over again. But these regiments slam into the 5th Regiment and the 27th Regiment with artillery in the road, and they hold the line. So despite these other two regiments fleeing back, the British really don't have the ability to run off the Americans like they did at Bladensburg. And as a result, they're going to inflict a large number of casualties on the British. The British, not really sure why those guys are fighting like this. They, they've never fought like this before. But they don't realize that this is just a foretaste of what they're going to face a little bit later on up this road when they get towards the main effort that Smith has built. And, and they're gonna, at the Battle of North Point, Robert Ross is going to get shot down by two militiamen. Uh, they just uh, had a, a letter for sale. I believe it was in um, it was one of the auction houses, and a, a friend of mine bought it and actually donated it to the Maryland Historical Society. And it, the surgeon who attended Robert Ross and took the musket ball out of his chest, he got shot along his bridle arm and it entered his uh, lung from the left side underneath his armpit, went right through his body, and, and killed him almost instantly. So Robert Ross, Major General, is going to get killed at the Battle of the North Point. He was a pretty popular general. The senior colonel is going to take it over, and he's going to go up to fight uh, this main body. They're going to fight against a naval commander named John Rogers. He's going to build a, an area along the line with Smith called Rogers Bastion, which is known as modern-day Patterson Park in Baltimore. Pretty good uh, defensive positions. He has all these Marines under his command. He has what's left of Miller's Marines. He also brought his own Marines to the USS Guerrier, which was uh, in Delaware Bay at the time. But John Rogers is a first-rate commander, whether on land or at sea, and he handles his men quite well. And he works really well with Samuel Smith. So, so it's a really good Army-Navy cooperative uh, effort in Baltimore, very different than at Bladensburg. Armistead's going to be in command of Fort McHenry. He's an artilleryman, but he really doesn't have a lot to do because he's outranged by the British ships uh, during the fight at Baltimore. Samuel Smith's in charge, of course. Samuel Smith is pretty iron-willed. Let me tell you how iron-willed he is. He says, if you live in Baltimore in the weeks leading up to the fight, everybody falls out and starts to dig entrenchments. Morning, noon, night. White, black free, slave, they didn't care who you were, everybody fell out, everybody worked on defenses, nobody rested for three solid weeks. Every citizen of Baltimore had to do their bit, and he declared martial law and made them do it. Battle of Baltimore is pretty much a land sea operation. The Royal Navy fails to smash the defensive bastion at Fort McHenry. We know this story already. Ross tries a maneuver against uh, the open flank in North Point, doesn't do very well there. Again, lack of British reconnaissance proves costly for both land and sea forces, just like at Norfolk. And Smith, extensive expertise uh, in, in defending. Here's Fort McHenry itself. Uh, interesting little piece here. This is called the water battery. They actually utilize this during the battle. It actually repels another British attempt to go around the, uh, the fort from the other side of the, of the harbor. Uh, it's rejected as well. The Americans drive them off in the middle of the night with uh, grape and, and uh, round shot. And uh, they also withstand the bombardment. The bombardment is pretty good because they're hit, getting hit with rockets and shells. But this is a stone and masonry fort. It's built by a guy named John Jacob Rivardi, famous French military engineer, uh, among others. Uh, and they are going to really build a solid, solid fort that's going to withstand a, a shelling that's going to be 25 hours long. Aftermath, 
of the war in Chesapeake Bay, we have the famous Star Spangled Banner. The British fail at uh, Baltimore. They, they uh, run into the main American line at the Hampstead Hill. The naval effort to smash the fort to smithereens doesn't work out. So Cochran has to make the decision to leave the bay once and for all. He's never given up on his New Orleans fight, however. And the aftermath is they go down to Bermuda. They go down to the West Indies. They west, rest, recoup, refit. They have one more campaign left in them, and that's New Orleans. And they're going to run into Andrew Jackson. And the Americans are going to send a second major general home in a coffin, uh, Edward Pakenham. So at that point, the battle, as you well know, was fought after the Treaty of Gent had already been signed. Uh, it was really a, a, a meaningless battle for at least uh, the British and the Americans because the, the, the results had already been decided several weeks earlier, but the message didn't get to Jackson in time to prevent the battle from happening. So I'll stop here, uh, take, it, take some time for a QA, and a and uh, we'll go from there. Is that okay, Jack, for you? Okay. Sir. I had heard, I think maybe something on TV, uh, after the British, the British sacked Washington, two things occurred. I think when they were blowing up the Navy Yard, something about they'd stuffed a well or it was, it was a devastating explosion. That was not the Navy Yard. It was over the Washington Arsenal across the Anacostia River, what then known as the East Branch. It was where, uh, where uh, Fort McNair is today. There was a bunch of munitions hidden in a well, a British... Uh, sailor or, or, or marine leaned over the well with a torch and a spark fell in it and blew, blew it up and killed a number of them because it literally heaved these rocks in the air and, and killed a large number of soldiers nearby. It was the largest explosion of, of the entire uh, campaign. Um, everybody was concerned that the Americans had set it up, but now they had hid some gunpowder barrels down this well. They, they looked down it and the spark fell down and set it off. But it, it did happen. It was a pretty, pretty uh, uh, devastating explosion. How about uh, as the British marched away, a storm? There was a storm that came up, and that storm was uh, kind of a nor'easter, a uh, very heavy storm. They, some people credit it with uh, preserving some of the buildings. The White House, for instance, uh, didn't get burned too badly because the rains helped uh, keep the fires from <coughs> crumbling it down. I, I sometimes would argue that it did and it didn't. Uh, the storm itself uh, was effective in, in perhaps uh, maybe some of the smaller fires, but the, the large White House fire literally gutted the building. The, the stone wasn't going to burn at that point. I mean, so it, it, the fire had already done its damage by the time the storm had come up. What it did do is it damaged a lot of uh, Gordon's uh, ships in the Potomac, so they, uh, they were worried about being able to get back down. Uh, they were able to jury-rig some masts and that sort of thing. They had a couple of their bomb ships actually get driven onto the shore and had to get them hauled back in by some frigates that were there. But, uh, yeah, good point on that. Uh, the storm did have some effect, but it wasn't as big as a lot of people make it out to be. Okay. Other questions? Yes, sir. As an item of interest, I worked for a company who put the foundation in the White House. Oh, yeah. And the original construction was that the house was supported in the center, from what they tell me. Yes. Then they put the foundation in, and they tell me today it's like a modern office building, steel construction. Yeah, they were, they've, they've been, well, besides the remodeling that the British did in, in, in 1814. Uh, the, the White House has been totally remodeled uh, two, two other times. Theodore Roosevelt in 1902 remodeled the White House in the interior, built the West Wing at the time. And then uh, Harry Truman uh, literally guts the White House from top to bottom in 1952. He stays in Blair House uh, for at least two years of his presidency, uh, but he, he literally takes it from top to bottom. Now, I've, I've actually been through most of the White House. I got to go up into the president's uh, uh, you know, quarters and everything else uh, in my job that I, when I was there, and it's kind of a neat thing. What they did with the White House is that it's built on, it was designed by a guy named, I believe his name was Thornton, and, and he heard, Thornton had heard that George Washington, who was going to select the design of the White House, liked oval rooms. So what Thornton does, he made sure his design had three ovals one on top of the other. So we have the diplomatic oval room down in the basement or the first ground floor, which is where FDR did his fireside chats. Okay, so right there is the first oval. The next oval is the blue oval room, which is on the main state floor, uh, where they have the Christmas tree for the White House uh, uh, during the uh, Christmas season. And then the top oval is on the president's floor, which, where the president's quarters are. And it's called the yellow oval, and it was where George Herbert Walker Bush used as his private study. Uh, and so it was built around those ovals, and then the two wings on each side, east wing and west wing, go around the ovals. And then we have, I have the office buildings down below to go out even further. So, but the White House itself, you know, it didn't have those, those wings until after Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, the west wing wasn't built until 1902. It used to be, um, uh, they had greenhouses. And on the other side, the east wing side, it was stables. 
This was the second time. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, I <laughs> yeah, got it. Truman. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. There was a lot of things going on in Lake Erie about that time, too. There were. Uh, there any connection between what was happening with Oliver Hazard Perry and that whole crew up there? What was going on? Yeah, well, especially the, the fall of 1814 uh, looked like it was originally going fairly well, but you have a one two punch that causes the Treaty of Gent to actually tilt towards us. For the very, so the British were hoping to get some concessions. Remember, in 1814, they're occupying the entire state of what would become the state of Maine. They, they, they had, they're occupying all of Michigan. Uh, they, they have taken you know, chunks of this upper part. The war's not going well for us. And then we, we, we win the Battle of Baltimore, and we win the Battle of Plattsburgh with Thomas McDonough. Okay, Thomas McDonough is a is a kind of an under uh, often undersung naval hero of the War of 1812, and we go into the negotiations with Plattsburgh and Baltimore. So the British are saying, you know, this isn't working out the way we thought. We don't want the Americans coming back next year because now we've taken back you know the Lake Champlain invasion quarter because of McDonough's efforts up there. They have no boats left that can stop another American invasion from coming in. Let's just get what we can get out of it, get the status quo and move on. But that's a good point. That, that does have an influence at the treaty agent. Other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, I was interested in your comment that uh, the, the, the British had never lost a ship-to-ship -ship battle until that was the one. They don't remember losing one. They may have, but... <laughs> we know that the French had a very powerful Navy at the time, as we saw at the Battle of the Capes. Right. So they never lost... I mean... They never lost, you mean, just one ship? Ship to ship engagement, what I'm saying is a frigate versus frigate. Now, they've lost, you know, like the, the larger action, like the Battle of the Capes, you're right. I mean, the French won that. But in a ship to single ship action, and, and the British were very proud of their sea captains and their prowess. Now, let me tell you, the, uh, the HMS Shannon, a guy named Philip Broke, that was the commanding officer of the HMS Shannon, was almost, uh, he was the best seagoing captain in anybody's Navy. The guy was just that good, and he's the one that took out the Chesapeake uh, uh, in, in 1813 uh, and dared him to come out to a fight. Uh, and Chesapeake, uh, commanded by James Lawrence, uh, decides to do so. And of course, the result was a tremendous amount of casualties on the American side. Um, I read once an article, and John, I don't know whether you've ever heard this story about the Chesapeake. It's the last of the six frigates. And somebody told me they ran out of Southern Live Oak, which was what gave Old Ironsides its name. And the Chesapeake was more what they call fur built, which is a uh, much more of a splinter prone wood than, than the southern live oak was. So, the, so old Ironsides, you know, was called that, you know, Constitution, because literally its oak was tough and sometimes they'd fire a round shot against it and it would bounce off. But in the Chesapeake's case, when round shot came in, it crashed into this fur built, kind of ran out of money frigate, the last of the six to be built, as I said. And that's caused a tremendous amount of casualties on the deck of the Chesapeake. But they also ran into, it's like, you know, their, their best frigate captain in the entire Navy, Philip Broke. And uh, he, he, uh, he takes the Chesapeake and they tow it back to England. It's, it sits there for decades afterwards. You mentioned one admiral who was also a general. Was this uh, <laughs> a common thing in those days? It, it was sometimes. Uh, it, you know, the French did this all the time. The British never would think of it, but uh, the... Uh, Cock Coburn was that would act as if he was a land commander, but he'd use his Royal Marines. Uh, remember, he couldn't command army troops because they had the same joint problems that we had. Army troops were commanded by generals, but Navy troops, Marines, could be commanded by naval officers. So, so th they had over a thousand Royal Marines at Bladensburg. You know, so he's got a pretty large, sizable force, and they're pretty well disciplined. And so you have these guys commanding at the same time. Barney. When he uh, loses his flotilla at, in, uh, at, at, in 1814, he just turns his flotilla men into, uh, into, into infantry. And he commands them and, and he joins them up with Miller's 103-man Marine Company out of the Marine Barracks at 8th and I Street. You know, and again, you know, Samuel Miller was a contender for the commandancy in, 19, in 1820. He's going to lose out to a guy named Archibald Henderson, who's going to be the longest serving commandant in the history of the Corps, 39 years as commandant. But when the Secretary of Navy gets these two nominees, he has Miller on one hand, he has Henderson on the other. Henderson is, makes sure that the Secretary remembers St. Leonard's Creek, where Miller left the field of battle, you know. I don't know why, but he must have had a reason. And the Secretary goes, hmm, you're the commandant. <laughs> 
So he kind of, Henderson was known, you know, he wanted something, he got it. And he did by saying, he's saying, don't forget, you know, Miller left the field of battle at St. St. Leonard's Creek. So he, Miller was never going to be commandant as long as Henderson was around. Henderson stays on, uh, in the commandant's, he dies in the commandant's house in 1859. Uh, and uh, General Amos, who, uh, mo our most recent commandant, just before General Dunford, told me a story. I asked him, I get to interview the commandant every four months uh, in my role as a director of Marine Corps history. So I go up and see the, you know, the senior Marine and I said, have you seen the ghost of uh, Archibald Henderson in the, in the house here? And he says, no, I haven't seen him. But I tell you what has happened, he said, I went away for a weekend and somebody, uh, something, turned an upstairs shower on. So when we came back, it had destroyed an entire uh, side of the commandant's uh, house uh, it, it, as the water ran down the walls. So they had to get it all repaired. He says, no one can tell me to this day why that shower came on. And I said, it was Henderson. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> he doesn't want anybody else to live in the house. The rumor was that he had lived there for so long, he attempted to will the home to his son when he passed away. And somebody had to remind his son that, you know, that it was a government building that he was living in. <laughs> and he can't will it to anyone. <laughs> so, yes. Uh, Fort Washington, Maryland, that didn't play much of a role, did it? Well, it's pretty ignominious. Uh, they ha it was commanded by a guy named Samuel Dyson. Uh, he was told to, uh, to stop Gordon's flotilla coming up the Potomac River during the 1814 campaign. He says, but you have the uh, discretion to blow the fort up to keep it falling into enemy hands if there's a landing made to get at its weak landward side. Uh, Dyson doesn't wait for any landing. In fact, as soon as the uh, ships show up, he blows them up. The British are shocked. They go, wow, he didn't even fire a shot. And he flees uh, towards the interior of Maryland. Uh, some of the Marines that were there, as well as the, some of the artillerymen from the Army, joined David Dixon Porter across the river at Fort Belvoir, modern-day Fort Belvoir, called the White House at the time. And they do attempt to stop Gordon's flotilla from going up. And uh, I remember Porter writes a letter to the Secretary of the uh, Navy saying, well, this, these two guys shouldn't be, um, you know, painted with the same brush to, that Dyson's going to get painted with because these guys were really brave guys and Dyson was the one that really uh, ran away. He's later court-martialed about three weeks later and cashiered from the army and, and uh, stripped of his rank. Yeah, but that was an ignominious uh, destruction. It was a bad, badly constructed fort. They said it, a, a strong ship could have knocked it over and Gordon could have, I think, would eventually have taken it. But at least the Americans could have at least fired a shot uh, before they blew it up. <laughs> so, yes sir. Uh, you mentioned the uh at the time, there would have been coal torpedoes, those large explosive devices. Right. How did they actually work? In other words, what was the detonation methodology? The well, they had a wire. What it was is it was kind of like a, it's a, it wasn't a spar like you would see on a CSS Hunley. It was a keg-like device. And it would be reeled out. And literally, the, 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 the boat would do it at a night attack, get close enough to the large man of war that they could float it down stream or wherever the direction the current was running in, safe enough so that you wouldn't be seen, but close enough where you could see if it's going to be next to the hull. And the idea was to get about maybe, you know, 30, 40 meters from the ship itself and let it float. Well, they had a wire, and the wire device that Elijah Mix had developed, uh, you could yank on this wire once uh, it was in place, and it would set off a, a, a detonator device that would explode the, uh, the larger thing. Correct, like a lanyard, but it didn't have. It, it wasn't like they were going to set it on fire, like you would think a long burning fuse. It would. It wouldn't work because it was in the water. So what they had to do was be able to set it off by yanking on it in, in a lanyard type way. What happened with uh, the one time they tried to get the Plantagenet was as it floated down to about 12 feet away, it, either the tension caused the detonator to go off early or what, but it blows up. And the British are shocked. They, they had no idea why this explosion occurred. But again, they didn't really uh, think too much of it. Although Stephen Decatur likes the idea of using torpedoes, he says, you know what, this is a great poor man's navy. And they wanted them in Newport, they wanted them in New York, and they wanted them in, in, uh, in Baltimore. So uh, Baltimore guys, they, they say, well, won't the ships that you guys are using get blown up too, most likely? And they said, yeah. He says, well, we're not giving you any ships. He says, you can figure it out yourself. So Mix uh, is given one ship, the Chesapeake's Revenge. He goes down to Norfolk and sees that one stationary vessel, tries it, it doesn't work, and they give up. But later on, it's going to come back in Civil War and later on, of course, you know, modern day mines and torpedoes are pretty effective and it is a poor man's navy. Other questions? Okay, if not, oh, okay, one more. Oh, yep. Yes, sir, go ahead. Uh, I started off getting lectures on history from Confederate veterans in Richmond, okay, 88 years ago, okay? <laughs> 
<laughs> and this is the best damn history lecture I have ever heard. Well, thank you. Models. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Well, I hope you liked it. Thank you very much.